Scientists often use models of situations, even if they are not purely accurate to what happens in the real world, to help explain phenomena. This is true for studying the movement of particles in a gaseous state. There are many types of gases that we interact with on a daily basis, some of which are important for our survival. When we look at particles of a gas, they tend to behave in certain ways. Scientists can use a model to predict the behavior of real gases based on a set of rules that they use to theoretically create a perfect gas, which we call an ideal gas. This theoretical, aka not real gas, is defined by the following conditions. 1. The particles within an ideal gas are in constant random motion. 2. The size of each gas particle is negligible to the size of the volume of the container that they occupy, meaning that the gas is considered to take up basically no volume which leaves the container and the remainder of the volume to be open space in which the extremely small particles can move. 3. There are no intermolecular forces between ideal gas particles, meaning none of them will be held together. And 4. All collisions between gas molecules are perfectly elastic, meaning when they run into each other, no energy is lost and the molecules continue on with no loss of speed. To sum this up, there are no forces acting between the gas molecules and the particles do not take up any space. This creates a situation that is ideal for chemists to build models around when studying gases. One such scientist, Robert Boyle, established that if an ideal gas is at a constant temperature, the pressure exerted by the gas is inversely proportional to the volume of the container it resides in. So in this example, if we have ideal gas particles within a particular volume, and then we reduce the volume by half, it will double the amount of pressure exerted by the gas. This is known as Boyle's Law, and can be expressed in a few different ways as seen here. P represents pressure, V represents volume, and K is a constant that keeps the proportions between the two. These equations can be used to answer questions like the following. A scuba diver has a tank of air with a volume of 12 cubic decimeters at a pressure of 203 kilopascals. As they descend to a depth where the pressure is 405 kilopascals, what will be the new volume of the air in the tank? Assume that the temperature is constant. We can use this specific Boyle's Law equation to answer the question. We plug in our known values for P1, V1, and P2. We then solve for V2 through a little algebra, as seen here. We get a final volume of 6 cubic decimeters. Now, in a perfect and imaginary situation, calculations with ideal gases are great. But in the real world, that is not the case. And when we look at real gases, they behave differently compared to their ideal form because of their natural properties that cannot be ignored. But calculating ideal gas measurements are helpful because they can be extremely close to the behavior of real gases under the correct conditions. We see a lot of deviation with real gases compared to ideal gases when it comes to extremes, such as low temperature and high pressure. Remember that with an ideal gas, the assumption is that there are no intermolecular forces and the gas itself takes up no volume. If we take a real gas under these extreme conditions, such as low temperature and high pressure, there is a great deviation that takes place from the ideal. If a gas is under high pressure, it generally means that there is a high volume of gas particles compared to available open space, which is the exact opposite of the ideal condition. And if gas molecules are at an extremely low temperature, it means that they are not moving fast, meaning their collisions will not be elastic and intermolecular forces between gas particles will be much more significant. This again is the opposite of an ideal gas. In either of these cases, Boyle's law that we learned about on the last slide, which relates pressure and volume, no longer have the same proportional relationship. Real gases can be put into situations in which they can behave similar to their ideal calculated state, which means they would have to have a low pressure and high temperature. In either case, knowing the limitations and being able to compare an ideal gas from a real gas is an important point for the exam. We discussed Avogadro's law in the last video, which states that gases that occupy the same volume under the same temperature and pressure will have the same number of particles. We can take that idea one step further here while talking about an ideal gas. Based on Avogadro's law, if we are dealing with one mole of any ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure, which means we have the ideal gas at 0 degrees Celsius and 1 atmosphere, or 101.3 kilopascals, it will occupy a specific volume of 22.7 cubic decimeters per mole. We call this the molar volume, and this is true for any gas under ideal conditions. 
So one mole of helium gas compared to one mole of chlorine gas, both under ideal gas conditions at standard temperature and pressure, would occupy the same volume which would be a container at 22.7 cubic decimeters. So each would contain the same number of particles within the volume, which would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Though the masses would be different because the mass of each particle is different. And for that, we can use the periodic table to simply look up the molar mass of each substance. The further away the gases deviate from standard temperature and pressure, the more deviation there will be in the volume that they will occupy if the particle numbers are kept the same. As we have seen from the last few slides, there are four different variables taken into account when looking at an ideal gas. Those are temperature, pressure, volume, and moles. Any number of these variables can be studied in terms of how one can impact the other with an ideal gas. All you need to do is keep two of them constant and then change the third variable and observe what happens to the fourth variable. The combined gas law shows the relationship between absolute temperature, pressure, and volume and is written as P1 times V1 divided by T1 is equal to P2 times V2 divided by T2. P is pressure, V is volume, and T is temperature. And the 1 represents the initial state of the gas, and the 2 represents the final state of the gas. In terms of units, you should be using cubic decimeters for volume, Kelvin for temperature, which is an absolute scale starting at zero, and kPa for pressure. Using this equation, we can take some known variables about one state of a gas and use them to figure out an unknown variable about another state. Let's work through this problem as an example. A sample of gas occupies a volume of 2.50 cubic decimeters at a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals and a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. If the pressure is increased to 152 kilopascals and the temperature is raised to 57 degrees Celsius, what will be the new volume of the gas? You can see from the question that we are given 5 out of 6 variables in our equation. To keep our units functioning properly, we need to convert both Celsius measurements into Kelvin. We can do that by adding 273.15 to both values. To make things easier, we can use some algebra to rearrange the equation where we are solving for our unknown variable, V2. We plug in the numbers and do some algebra to solve for the final volume, which will end up being 1.83 cubic decimeters. This equation again works well when comparing different states of the same gas using those three variables. But what if you also take into account our fourth variable, moles? To do this, we must use a different equation called the ideal gas equation, which is written as PV equals nRT. P is pressure, V is volume, N is moles of the gas, R is a universal gas constant, and T is temperature, again in Kelvin. The R value is new here, and it is a constant that brings together the proportional measurements for every variable in the equation that holds true for all ideal gases. The value of R is 8.31 joules per Kelvin mole. This equation is commonly used to calculate properties of gases, determine the molar mass of a gas, and analyze gas behavior among other things. Let's look at a sample problem. A 2.50 gram sample of an unknown gas occupies a volume of 1.50 cubic decimeters at a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals. Determine the molar mass of the unknown gas. We start again by converting the Celsius measurements into Kelvin. We do that by adding 273.15 to 27 to get 300.15 Kelvin for the temperature. Now we are asked to find the molar mass of the unknown gas, and we can use our ideal gas equation to first find the moles of the gas, and then use that to find the molar mass. So we can rearrange our equation, like this, to solve for moles. We plug in all of the appropriate numbers and perform the calculation to come out with an answer of n equals approximately 0.0609 moles. So in this sample, we have 0.0609 moles of the unknown gas. To calculate the molar mass, we simply divide grams of the gas by the moles. We can do that by taking the grams of the sample that we started with, 2.50 grams, and dividing by the moles of the sample that we calculated, 0.0609 moles. We get an answer of 41.05 grams per mole. If we want to take it one step further, we can try and identify what the unknown gas is based on the molar mass. Taking a look at the periodic table, argon has a molar mass of 39.948 grams per mole. 
With the information that we have, and 39.948 being close to 41.05, we could say that it is likely that this gas is argon.